when you're doing three films back to back. The danger of the train derailing was huge. We knew we had to plan these movies as, as detailed as we possibly could because there'd be little, very little room for error. When Peter set out to start designing the film, he basically pre-visualized every shot. Uh, sometimes with a high level of detail, sometimes just as a sketch. It's to give everyone, including Peter, a good feel as to, okay, this, this is what the flavor of the film is, and he can, he can then evaluate where, where scenes are running too long, um, thing, even scenes that he may want to cut out entirely, all before he's wasting film, shooting actors and sets and having a crew costing tens of thousands standing around. We knew we had to keep run, run a very tight ship, as it were, so that when we started shooting, we knew we'd get it tired, we knew we'd get exhausted, that all sorts of pressures would descend on us, and we just had to have a great focus plan to be able to get us through each day. When we were developing the movie, Peter spent an extensive amount of time committing the film in its entirety to storyboards. And he ended up storyboarding all the films, you know, basically every frame we see in these films had already been storyboarded by Pete by Peter. And um, so we were able to work from visual reference. The storyboarding process was the most basic form of pre-visualizing the film. It's 2D pencil drawings, single panels, nothing's moving, there's no real evidence of what the camera moves are going to be. You get an idea, okay, we pan from this character to this character, we tilt down from this object to that object, but we don't get any feel for how fast those ca you know, camera moves are, or actually even the logistics. Christian storyboarded most of the films that I made. He, he, I first met him when he was like a 17-year-old school kid. When I'm storyboarding with Peter, I think I've got the luckiest job on the planet. So you get a, a sort of an effect of the, the horses. I sit down with him, you know, would be and he describes like the shot to me. So usually I get yeah. it in the first drawing, sometimes I have to push it to two. If it's a really difficult shot, I might have to just quickly do a third sketch. Christian understands very much the sensibility that I have, and we started storyboarding as we were writing the script, so we didn't even wait for the script to be finished. It's his way of checking that the ideas that he has for telling the story are going to work. I mean, that is the single thing that I think storyboards are most valuable for, for me, is that they're a cheap pass at the movie. You know, I, I get to make the movie at a really, really low cost for the price of a few pencils and some paper. But it effectively has put me through the process of making the film. As a director, I, I've, I've had a go. I've done version number one and I can get to look at the movie complete. Which was a great tool. It was never intended and never was the final version of the movie. I've worked with some directors who will storyboard their film and you'll really see those storyboards on screen. Peter's not that director, that kind of a director. Peter uses it for inspiration, for communication with the departments, but you know that those storyboards are gonna change. They're a starting point, not an end point for Peter. Not only doing the storyboards, but then having them shaded and then photographing them as an animatic, we had made what we called an animatic, which was basically um, videotaping each frame of the storyboards. The storyboards are all, yeah, you know, they're digitised, they're edited together as the shots will or would be edited together in the film. And it, it's basically a little, you know, a little black and white 2D drawing version of, of the film itself. We'd got some local New Zealand actors together in a studio, um, and there was five or six actors and they had read through the script in a recording studio playing the different characters and um, and then those voice tracks had been edited with the storyboards. What are you doing? Fried eggs, sausages and nice crispy bacon. I've saved some for you Mr Frodo. You idiot! Put this out! I was looking at a, at a version like of the Lord of the Rings as almost like a comic book with with words and we put temp music with it. You're, you're seeing the storyboards as they pace in the film, as you want them to pace in the film, and so you get a feeling for the progression of story and the pacing of the storytelling. Peter told us about it, and he was like, all right, I'll screen it for you before we start filming. And um, we all got to Pete's house, and he screened us this animatic, and it was a trip to read the script and, and talk about the script and get ready for the process of making the film, and then suddenly, see a very rough compilation of those ideas put onto the screen. I mean, in some ways, we'd felt like we'd watched the film. What was great about that is the script was powerful enough that it actually came across and it resonated. 
uh, in that rough form. And what we did on this movie, which I've never done before, is I wanted to go one more stage with the storyboards and make them more accurate than they usually are. Grant Major would draw up the final plans for each set that had been designed. Some of these were initially made into architectural models which uh, were made fairly, fairly quickly. We ended up calling them animatic models and we used them um, so that Peter could actually get a lipstick camera, get little toys, you know, we get little figurines that we always had like hobbit size, you know, human size, you know, Balrog size. We had all these little toys and it was great. He could actually have them in this little, you know, model that was either a reference point for the set or for a miniature down the road. So the storyboards that he had done previously were expanded on shot by shot um, by the use of his camera working around our models. And we'd have, have it hooked up to a video monitor that I'd have a freeze frame function on. And he'd say, okay, that's, you know, sometimes you'd just sit there and you'd see him sort of, you know, just pottering around, just trying to work out what kind of camera move he'd want to do for the shot. And you'd place the figures and he'd, you know, Okay, that's the frame, I pause it and then draw from the screen. Christian could actually sit there and go, okay, so you're thinking this frame, yeah, okay. And then he could actually draw out, sketch out um, the storyboard that was reflected, reflected on the monitor that actually, you know, was to scale. That, you know, that was showing something that had the figure to the background all to scale and made sense and could actually be replicate, replicated when you thought about what you were shooting on the set. We basically knew that we were publishing a set of storyboards that were actually accurate, yeah, that this up. angle was here. And when we finally walked onto the set in a year's time with the actors and the full set was built, we'd be able to find exactly the same angle on set as we had with the miniature. Early on, essentially the first set that was ever constructed was Bad Gang. Peter uh, Jackson thought, hey, you know what, what we need to do is we need to go in there and, and get a video camera and, and I, I'm going to sort of work through kind of, you know, the space and just get a feeling for it. Yeah, you, you will keep an eye on Frodo, won't you? Yes, I will. Two eyes as often as I can spare them. Scene 12, shot one. I was very worried about Bad Gang because I knew just how small the set was and once you get 50 or 60 crew members in there it's going to become very cluttered very quickly and very difficult to work in. And so I wanted just to be able to really get my head into how we would shoot these scenes and I'd done my little um, lipstick camera mock-ups with a cardboard model some months earlier because we were also trying to figure out ways to shoot the scales too because we had Gandalf being, had to be tall and Bilbo and Frodo happened to be small, and, and we were starting to get our heads into how we were going to shoot all this stuff. And I got a few of the of the people on the film. So we turned up on a Sunday on set with a with a video camera. I played Bilbo, and, and Rick Porus played something, and we and we sort of we sort of did a, a mock up of the entire scene that we were going to shoot. Ultimately, with Ian McKellen and Elijah and Ian Holm, and. And then again, it, it turned out to be a, a relatively accurate, I mean, I think we made script changes eventually, so things altered a bit, but we, it turned out to be a relatively accurate version of what ultimately was in the film. Through me, that ring would wield a power too great and terrible to imagine. Beyond the storyboarding, we also did like another level of planning, um, which is sort of like bringing the storyboards to life in a variety of ways. And it's called pre-visualization as well, it's called pre-vis. Pete was able to use Previs to help him tell his story. He wanted to turn a lot of his 2D storyboards into 3D moving cameras. He's a very dynamic filmmaker. He likes big sweeping camera moves. Just at the, at the ideal moment while we were in pre-production, um, Rick McCallum, the producer of Star Wars, came to New Zealand on a trip. And I was talking to Rick about the whole pre-visualization process, and they'd obviously basically developed a, their own previous department for the for Star Wars. And so Rick said, look, if you're ever, you know, if you're ever in the States, you know, come by and uh, visit and we'll, and we'll show you what we've done. And so um, a few weeks later, we, we were in San Francisco and visited the ranch. And, you know, um, he was incredibly generous at just basically introducing us to their previous department. Rick McCallum and George Lucas have been incredibly helpful to, um, to him and to the rest of us in terms of just you know, offering up advice with some of these new approaches that, that they were doing. So Peter really grabbed a hold of this idea and, and, um, 
and said, hey, guys, this is something we should be doing. So what we, what we did was we, we went out and we, we searched for young, uh, you know, uh, recent graduates of, of graphic art schools and, uh, you, know, you know, the kind of, the kind of um, folks that, that love film and have a passion for film, maybe wanting to try to make, a, make a, um, a foray into the world of visual effects, and this could be an interesting opportunity for them. Previs is doing about 144 shots from Film One. The workshop and the art department provide the designs that we use in Previs to build um, in the computer. The shots that we're working on are effects shots and anything that Peter can't really get his head around, um, that he wants to take a look at it in the 3D environment. And that's what Previs is for, to um, help Peter create his vision. Peter was very much present in previous and he'd come in very exciting to him to see his you know see his movie coming to life and trying out the camera angles on sets that hadn't been built yet first thing we did was the whole Casadoom stair chase we built basically a copy of Alan's drawing sort of in 3D in a computer and began to experiment with angles and shots the miniature of the staircase was also constructed by Richard Taylor. The actual miniature that ended up being used in the movie was one of the very first miniatures that Richard built, and so we were able to also use that miniature to plot a lot of camera angles and to plan it. And so, you know, gradually over the course of possibly a year, this drawing of Alan Lee's had inspired and led to um, the creation of this hugely complicated, hugely expensive scene. Peter cut and cut out a lot of bits, but it was even wilder. You know, I mean, you had you had Frodo's point of view going down the stairs, and it's like going, you know, running like this and up at him, and nearly falling off. You know, all this close work on them, and in some ways, and, and tripping and falling and rolling down right, right almost to the breach and being grabbed at the end. You know, and looking over, and then the arrows start coming. You know, it was uh, it, so it was it was wilder, but eventually it got to the point where you know you got to cut somewhere. Too bad. And obviously it's a fantastic tool and it just became apparent, well, that, that's, that's a tool I'm going to need to use to help create these films. Christian Rivers storyboarded um, the film with me, which is sort of continuing. I mean, even today he's still working, doing, doing storyboards for the 2000 Return of the King and he's been working on this for probably, oh, it must be nearly four to five years now. I, I find that scenes that were born in Previs are often the more imaginative scenes because you, you feel brave when you're just devising these crazy shots with little computers and stuff, but ultimately those crazy shots play an important part in defining the style of the film. That's where I feel like I've, I've been able to learn from him because it's the stuff that I was sure wouldn't work that he makes work. And one of the things that I said to myself when I came down here was, you know, I already know what I know, but I don't know what he knows. So I'm going to keep my eyes open because he does a lot of things that shouldn't work but do and that's the fun of it is is hearing something that sounds just impossible at the beginning and then uh, seeing how he puzzles it out